Greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Metal Magdalene with Jet right here on Metal Messiah Radio. Today, we have a special guest with us. We have Chris Naughton of the black metal band Winter Filleth. Welcome to the show, Chris. Thank you for having me. So, Chris, what kind of music were you, like, interested in when you were growing up, and what led you to want to form Winter Filleth? <laughs> mm-hmm. I, well... There, uh, therein lies two quite different um, different genres of music and different areas of music. So, so I'm from a little town just outside of Manchester in the UK, and uh, and when I was growing up, the the town where I was from was completely entrenched in uh, in like punk and ska music. Mm-hmm. So, so my kind of formative bands as a child were um, were, were listening to sort of I, I don't know the kind of the, the punk rock stuff. Um, from from the kind of the early 90s and uh, and beyond and then um kind of being part of that whole scene so a lot of the shows that i was seeing at that at that age were you know were, were bands like that you know lots of kind of those like fat records bands and epitaph bands and, and moon scar bands and stuff that used to kind of come through our town so uh it probably wasn't until i was at kind of college age which in the uk is like sort of 16 to 18 somewhere around there mm-hmm that I, I really started kind of listening to, I suppose, metal specifically. And um, so it probably wasn't until around around then that I started kind of getting into some of the, the formative albums that would go on to be the ones that inspired me to do this band. But yeah, so I guess around then it was listening to things, um, well, I guess like the entry-level metal, like everybody listened to, you know, Metallica and, and Pantera and, and all that sort of stuff. But then I guess the older I got and the more more I realized that there was um, there was better, more kind of thoughtful and, uh, and just more epic metal in the subgenres, the more you kind of dug below the, the surface of the, the kind of mainstream metal that you know, you're exposed to as a kid. That was where the real kind of inspiration and the, I guess the joy of doing this sort of stuff was found for me. So, um, you know, listening to bands like Ulver and Enslaved and Trud from the Ukraine and... Um, and you know, Emperor and all those kind of early black metal bands were the ones that really kind of inspired us to sort of do this band. So I guess, I guess that's where we were kind of coming out really with when we started this band. So, so tell us a little history behind the band, then, Chris. Chris. So um, Simon, who's the drummer, and I, we we started the band in 2007, and prior to 2007, we'd both been in a in a doom metal band called Atavist, and we'd done five albums with that band. And I think we got to a point with it, with that band where we were kind of sort of done with it really in, in, and had not a lot more to say at that stage. So we, we decided that we'd kind of get together and, and sort of try to do something, you know, that's based on history. So we, well, you know, sort of a slight, slight tangent from this. Simon and I had met, uh, as, as you do, you know, um, I think through maybe social media or something, maybe 10 years earlier. Mm-hmm. And... And, and we'd met over a kind of appreciation for, for certain aspects of history. And, and we'd been, you know, talking about various different things and the kind of the politics of history and, and uh, the interesting sort of folk stories and folklore of, of British history and, and kind of what all that meant. And and we sort of had the conversation that there'd never really been a band from this country that had done anything, I guess, as sincere as that. Um, it, you know, it had, it had always been more around things like, you know, uh, more influenced by the kind of 90s black metal. So I guess satanic, nihilistic more evil topics rather than, I guess, um, topics that are a little bit more kind of heartfelt and close to people's real lives rather than the kind of, I guess, the fantasy world of a lot of the other stuff that goes on. So we decided then to to do Winterfell, and, and in 2007 we released our first demo, which is called The Rising of the Winterfell Moon. And then from there on out, we've kind of put out an album every sort of two years or so, and to the point now where we're at our sixth album, and our 11 years into our career as a band. And, um, you know, I, I guess we can't really believe we've kind of got to where we are from where we started. So, <laughs> so, so Chris, what are your thoughts on, like, uh, I, I'm going to call it the art of black metal? Because a lot of times when people that don't really know a lot about it hear the words black metal, <laughs> they always assume Satan and blood and corpse paint and rituals and all that kind of stuff. And you guys really aren't that kind of a band. So have you ever had people, you know, like if you've gone to play like certain venues and they just see black metal band or whatever, assume that you're one of those kind of bands too? 
I think I think we've had people be kind of impressed and disappointed in probably <laughs> equal numbers that we that we are and we aren't. I think for me, there's there's a few different veins of black metal, and um, you know, not that I particularly am a, I'm a lover of the kind of the tags of subgenres, but we tend to get lumped in with what people are describing as atmospheric black metal. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you, if, if you read some of the other, you know, stuff, there's like the kind of nineties, the second wave, the first wave and all that sort of stuff and third wave. And so I, I think, um, for us, we were always interested in, in kind of real world topics and that kind of link with nature and history and, and, uh, and society and, um, and how that all kind of comes together and, and sort of using that to express it in, I guess, like uplifting, but still fierce black metal. Whereas I think there's the other vein of black metal, which is definitely more around the kind of the dark arts, if you will, and the kind of occultism and mysticism and nihilism and, you know, anti-religion and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, don't get me wrong. We as fans love both kinds, but um, where we were personally inspired and where we sort of saw Winterfell going was much more down the, um, I guess, positive, um, interesting kind of inspiring stories rather than as i said the kind of the fantasy realm if you like and now winter felleth like you said has been around for a little over a decade now so how would you say that your band has progressed over the years chris well if you listen to our first demo and if you listen to our new album then uh, i think you see quite <laughs> a stark, stark difference in uh, in style and ability you know, so when we, when we started Winterfell, I mean, we were still quite accomplished musicians then. We'd done five or six albums with other bands. But, um, you know, I think the first Winterfell album, for example, it, it shows quite a lot of that influence I was talking about. It's a bit more of that kind of punk influence in there, I think. And and sort of slightly, maybe more of the kind of doom metal influence of, of the previous band, Atavist. And actually, I think from that point on, when we had that kind of quite developmental album, which I think a lot of people love, and it's still got kind of a, a sort of raw charm to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think from the second album on, we really kind of found out what Winterfell sounds like, and and have really got kind of better over the years at sort of refining what that's become. We've become better musicians, better singers, um, both in the kind of extreme vocals and in terms of the literal singing vocals. Um, and and we've, I guess we've been, you know, we're, we're a decade older, we're a lot more experienced and, and worldly wise, I suppose. We've um, we've become, a, you know, a lot more educated about some of the topics that we've been discussing. And so we've, I think we've just kind of gone deeper with all of it to the point now where we find ourselves at our sixth album, mm -hmm. uh, The Howling of Erdem. And, you know, we, we decided to try and bring some of that folk influence that's quite, been quite important to the to the band conceptually and, I guess, I guess lyrically and, 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 you know, in many ways, and, and actually bring it into a full album rather than just the occasional interlude track on the albums. And now, was this like a group, a, you know, a group idea or whatever to put uh, the new album out, The Howling of Aerodome? I mean, like you said, it's completely different than anything you've done before, but is it's the progression of the band, Chris, you know? So did you all get together and be like, hey, we want to do this? No, not really, actually. <laughs> I mean, no, no, not that the guys were opposed to it or anything, but mm -hmm. um, so at, at, the, at the time, there's, there's five guys in Winterfell. Um, there's, there's myself and Simon, who formed the band originally, um, and so I play the guitar and he plays the drums. And there's Nick who plays the bass, Dan who plays the other guitar, and Mark who is our kind of non-performing sort of fifth member mm -hmm. who does like keys and helps with vocal arrangements. And he's like a professional musician. And um, and at the time, Nick was living with me kind of briefly in between, kind of moving between houses. And so we were sort of sat around a lot, you know, writing um, acoustic material together, just kind of playing in the house and and. I guess, you know, working in my little home studio. And we had this idea that we maybe sort of do something acoustic just as ourselves and, and either kind of put it out on a friend's label or maybe just kind of release it just for ourselves, really. But then actually the kind of the ideas we were coming up with, I thought were really great and the underpinned probably five or six songs that have now become the album. And it just felt at that point, you know, this could make sense as a Winter Phillip album. Uh, for anyone that knows the history of the band, we've always done sort of acoustic interlude tracks mm -hmm. uh, on, our, on our albums and that folk influence, if not in a kind of folk instrument way, certainly in a kind of melodic way, has always been in, in the songs. And so we um, we got to a point where we, where we were thinking, actually, this could probably be more than just, a, I guess, an experiment for Nick and I and, and actually decided to do it as a as a full band and so got everybody else involved and 
And then it became uh, more of a Winter Phillip album. So, you know, four or five demos down the road, we were then like, actually, no, this could be something much better. And so what are some of the lyrical themes in on this album, Chris? So, um... <laughs> well, to give you a little bit of background before I go into that, so mm-hmm. on lots of the other Winter Phillip albums, they've been around, um, I, I guess, like old English writing and poetry and, and history and folklore. But we've always kind of put a sort of slightly social politics, political slant and a kind of a bit of a read between the lines sort of um, idea behind the words mm-hmm. in that they're sort of, they're, they're referencing old stories and history and poems, but are kind of trying to bring it into the modern context and almost say, you know, let's put a mirror up in front of the world. Actually, we're not a lot different than we ever have have been, really. And, the, you know, the struggles of old are the struggles of now. It's just there's a different political facade in front of it or there's a different, um, I don't know, regime or, or however you want to describe it that, that's perpetuating it. But actually, you know, we've always gone through these things as humanity and we continue to do so. So I think we've always been a little bit kind of sharp-tongued, if you will, on uh, on those kind of issues. And so moving into this album, I think we kind of wanted to move away from that a little bit in the sense that, We've done quite a lot of that sort of influence and we just wanted to make this one a bit more um i guess softer if you like just just about some of those topics and and them in their entirety rather than kind of using them as a as a lens through which to view society now so um there's, there's five or six lyric tracks six lyric tracks on the album out of 12 and um there's some interesting ones on there so um the first track which is called the shepherd that's based on a on a Christopher Marlowe poem from the nine, the 1590s, which is one of the earliest kind of pastoral poems written in the UK, um, and that's about how this this shepherd falls in love with this field nymph, and kind of wants to um, to make her his wife and for her to come and live with him, and live in this kind of like romanticised idea of of I guess nature that that, that they had at that point. And then, interestingly, track nine on the album is called "The Nymph," which is a which is a, a kind of a, a parody of that poem written by another guy who was a friend of uh, Christopher Marlowe called Walter Raleigh, and and that's basically the nymph replying to the shepherd saying, "You know, I'm a field nymph and I live in nature and life's cool. Why would I want to come and live with you?" Almost, <laughs> and, um, and and they're two really interesting tales of folklore. And I think one's really the first one's really nice in the sense that it's it's about this kind of romanticized view of nature and and. I guess we know we should have that because it's really important. But then the second one is quite sarcastic and jaded. And I think for me kind of speaks to that whole um, English, British sense of humor that, that I don't think a lot of the rest of the world have. <laughs> and, um, and I think sarcastically, particularly, you know, that, that's something that doesn't exist a lot in, uh, in other, other languages and other countries, despite obviously the fact that, you know, Americans, Canadians, everyone kind of speaks English. You know that that sarcasm just all, isn't always there, and so we thought that was quite interesting and a, maybe a, a sort of reflection on the British condition, if you will. And then um, there's the song "Elder Mother," which we kind of put out as the single, if, if singles exist in 2018. <laughs> and um, and that was about uh, a folk story of this kind of tree witch who um, who haunts this tree, an elder tree, in uh, in a village called Long Compton in Oxfordshire, near uh, sort of south um, southwest of England. And the idea of that story is that she's this kind of uh, sort of cheeky kind of tree witch who um, who tempts men into doing this um, this challenge of hers. And so, whenever a king and his men from an invading country come to try and you know conquer England seemingly they kind of they, they uh, this witch sort of tempts them into doing her her challenge and if they fail it then she turns them into stone and so there's this famous um stone circle called the roll right stones which is in uh, on the oxfordshire and warwickshire border just the counties of england in the sort of southwest and um that was supposed to be a kind of group of men who mm-hmm. failed this woman the, the kind of lit witch's challenge so stuff like that really there's, there's, there's kind of bits of folklore in there there's there's references to, to early poetry. There's references to um, riddles, which were a really important aspect of, um, you know, passing on stories through folklore and also, I guess, like parlor games for um, for families as well. So uh, it felt like quite a positive album and one that was sort of framed in in the reality of the history rather than a kind of modern interpretation of it. If that makes any sense, it does. And also on this album, of course, Chris, you, you switch up your vocals and you sound so lovely on this. Was it fun for you to kind of just relax and do this kind of an album vocally? 
Well, um, yes and no. So <laughs> I wouldn't say that I could relax because it's very much more exposed than screaming your guts out you know, to, uh, to do a, a kind of heartfelt, um, tonally balanced, you know, harmonised album of singing. So that was a, a challenge in and of itself. But, um, but yeah, it's definitely easier on the vocal cords for the recording session. I mean, I've had, you know, horrible bleeding throat from from previous albums from going at it too hard so it was definitely good to be able to try something different and not come out of an album session with a sore throat for a week <laughs> now did you did you guys record this locally we always record with the same guy actually mm -hmm. so um a friend of ours called chris fielding who runs a who runs a studio called skyhammer studio in uh in chester which is quite near liverpool if you know that just sort of the uh, the west coast of england mm -hmm. and um he, uh, he also plays in a metal band called Conan, who are quite well known, actually. Mm -hmm. Sort of doom metal band. So anyway, he's had the studio for a long time, and, and we've recorded everything apart from our, uh, our first album with, with Chris. So um, And that's not just this band, that's other bands too. So, um, so yeah, we, we, we always go to Chris, and, and I think he was one of the main reasons why we kind of ended, with, ended up with the sound we have, and he was really kind of key in helping us sort of develop the sounds on the album and, and kind of what the band would become and so we always have a great time with chris he understands exactly kind of what we need and what we want and you know we have he's, he's become one of our close friends now to the point where we don't just kind of you know hang out around being in a studio you know we um we've become kind of friends socially as well so that's really cool and it's good to talk to him before the albums and, and he, him just kind of get where we're going all the time with the with the direction so for us it doesn't make sense to kind of go anywhere else really and so what was the recording process like for you then now, Chris? Because you guys are used to doing, like you said, throat bleeding screams during your recording sessions, and now you're not. So was that just, what was that whole vibe like for you? It was, um, it was awesome, but also very different. So, you know, when... I don't know if you ever made a, a kind of an album like that, but when when we always make albums like that, we do loads of pre-production. We've got mm -hmm. like uh, track by track demos of all the individual instruments and of all the songs. Um, it's all done to kind of um, you know a click track, and that, that all gets kind of recorded in the studio. So you have to layer it up piece by piece. Whereas whereas this was you know it's a lot more stripped bare in, in some ways and kind of more difficult in others. So. You know, there there was the, the kind of trying to capture the acoustic guitars in a really kind of warm and well-rounded way, which was which was challenging. We had to have sort of three or four different approaches to try and do that well. Um, we um, we had lots of sort of very varying instrumentation this time. So we had a cello player and a violin player this time, yeah. and a viola player. So um, that was new for all of us, really. Obviously, writing the parts for those instruments. And it not just sounding like my first violin part, <laughs> and then um, and obviously having to incorporate the you know the rehearsals and the um, development with these people as well, and you know just a wholly different approach really. You know, rather than just being the four of us in the studio for two weeks or however long it is, you know, it was it was kind of right this weekend it's the the session with the cello player, next weekend it's with the violin player. Probably got to do the vocals and the kind of percussion, you know, in the week, and then you know all, all that sort of stuff. So it, it was definitely more um, rigorous in terms of our planning, I think, because it had to be just because of the nature of it. Um, so yeah, different and challenging in different ways. Like with the metal albums, there's so many layers and so many tracks to record. You can kind of like almost overdo it and run out of time, mm -hmm. and then it becomes difficult to mix. Whereas this. It was really trying to find space for all the instruments, getting the great performances out. And as you know, you know, the vi a violin in the wrong hands, for example, <laughs> how horrible and scratchy and screechy can that be? Right. So, so it was really kind of finding the right players in the right mood and, and making them comfortable as well. So, uh, yeah, a very different process for us, but one that I'm incredibly proud of and um, and one that I think we're just pleased to have gone through. You know. So, how long is the album? I think. Um, the sort of standard version is 55 minutes long so almost an hour and um and there's 12 tracks on that and then there's a there's a deluxe version if you are so inclined <laughs> that's got four extra tracks on it so i think that brings it to about 75 minutes in total so there's quite a lot of material that we wrote for it and um and i had to record as well so so chris tell us a little bit about the cover art and the artist and what you guys were going for with the cover okay yeah sure so I guess 
you know, coming back to what I said before, anyone that's known the band for for as long as we've been around knows that we've always used uh, scenes from nature, like beautiful scenes from nature, mm-hmm. as the as the basis for our album covers. And the reason for that is that uh, obviously there's this historical element to the band that talks about you know the social and political and and I guess just personal interest points around history, but then also that kind of runs in parallel this kind of quite. Um, sort of vehement interest in the preservation of nature in the natural world. And I think that we've always used those images because they're, they're really stark and beautiful and just, you know, supposed to kind of focus the mind on how, how wonderful and, and, you know, all encompassing nature is and actually how, how badly we treat it as a human race. And regardless of how you feel and whether you like going out about in nature or not, actually, if nature fails, then we all die. And, Obviously, that's a little bit heavy responding to a question about <laughs> album artwork, but that, but therein lies the kind of the sort of the theory behind it, in the sense that you know it, it, it's it's rich and it helps us all survive, and and we all rely on it for our daily lives, and yet you know we allow kind of big companies in our countries to to rape and pillage it for packaging and fuel and resources and all that sort of stuff. So so we always want to try and draw um, draw people's attention to how how amazing it is, and I guess coming into this album. Because it was an acoustic album, not a metal album, we still wanted it to be a scene in nature, but we wanted it to be something a bit more kind of toned down, but still beautiful. And so um, we decided to do a painting of, of a landscape rather than a, a sort of a quite sharp photograph of landscape like on the previous albums. And I think that that really kind of adds to the the atmosphere of the album in the sense that it you know, it quite literally paints a picture of the sort of mood on the album. You know, it's got those quite autumnal colours, mm-hmm. the kind of the, the fire in the sky. And um, and it's based on quite a famous uh, bit of landscape, which is called Sycamore Gap. Now, there's a famous um, a famous wall that was sort of originally to divide Scotland and England, which is called Hadrian's Wall. And, um, and there's a gap in it with which this sort of single sycamore tree kind of grows in between, which is the, where the cover is. Uh, and that's up in Northumbria, so at the top right-hand corner of England. Hmm. And um, uh, and we just thought it was a really interesting interesting thing to do. You know, uh, it, it's it's been used a lot in in sort of popular culture and television. If you've ever watched any of the kind of I don't know like the Robin Hood TV series or any of that kind of stuff that the you know the the BBC and people like that put out over the years, then it, you know it, it's been used kind of very much in sort of folklore and popular culture. So we thought it'd be an interesting kind of place to do, but do it in our own way. And so we got this kind of relatively unknown to the metal scene artist called David Taylor to paint it. And he's just some kind of like older guy from, um, from originally from where we live, but he now lives in London and we just kind of got him to do it and sort of explain the concept of the project. And he was really into it. And, um, you know, I was even able to kind of get the original painting off him as well, which is now, um, hanging in my living room. So, uh, you know, yeah, a really kind of cool thing to have. And, um, just a, a slightly different way of approaching it, essentially that kind of same aesthetic. And now, what do you guys have going on, like, for the rest of this year? Do you have any shows planned or anything? Um, so we, we're doing a show tomorrow, actually, which is Friday the 13th, Uh-oh. so hopefully that doesn't go terribly, um, given it's the, uh, the you know, that spooky day. But um, we're, we're playing uh, St Pancras Old Church in London, which is an interesting venue for us to play because obviously as a metal band you tend not to be able to play in those kind of more um, I don't know upmarket interesting um, spaces like that. You know we we, we did a, we did an album launch show when the album came out last Friday at a similar place which is called Cheatham's uh, Baronial Hall in Manchester and that's a beautiful kind of period building and um, you know if you any, any inclination there's quite a lot of photos on on social media and the internet and similarly this week you know we wanted to do one in in london at this um this interesting church which is quite near the famous St. pancras station so so we're doing that um and then we're hoping to kind of do a full tour of this sort of later in the year so um going out into europe and and some of the kind of the wider uk to kind of bring the tour on the road and then over the summer, it's kind of quiet, actually. Dan, who's our other guitar player, he and his wife are expecting their third child. So um, oh, nice. that kind of put, puts us on a bit of a, a sort of slower burn for playing shows, you know, this summertime. So, you know, we have a flurry of activity now with a, with a view to kind of some bigger stuff towards the end of the year. Is, is our ambition, anyway. And Chris, if people want to learn more about Winter Phil, what are some of the best sites for them to do so? 
So, um, if you're on social media, we have a Twitter page and a Facebook page, as, as everyone unfortunately has to have these days, so you can find out about things. Um, we've also got a website, which is winterfilleth.com or winterfilleth.co.uk. They both work. Um, there's obviously the label that you can approach too, which is uh, Spine Farm Records. So um, we're, we're on there, or the Candlelight Records page too, which has got our previous back catalogue on it. Um, so lots of places, really. And um, obviously, you know, even, even places kind of like Metal Archives, you know, there's the, all, all the information on there seems to kind of be up to date and all the lyrics and everything. So if anyone's interested in kind of digging into some of the lyrics and the folklore and the stories, then, um, then they're more than welcome to do so. So there you guys have it. Winter Phillips has a new acoustic album out now, The Hallowing of Herodom, out on Candlelight Spine Farm. And Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about the band and new album, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. We appreciate your support and, uh, and hope you do well with your show. So uh, take it easy until next time.